This episode brought to you by DoorDash, the app that brings you food you're craving right now, right to your door. Also brought to you by MeUndies. With a variety of prints and sizes, however you want to be you, we got you covered. Hello, I'm the Nostalgia Critic. Guy, remember it? Oh, I can't hold it in! We're gonna talk about one of my favorite movies of all time, Who Framed Roger Rabbit? The 1988 groundbreaking blend of animation and live action was the equivalent of every little kid's Avengers Endgame at the time. Most of the cartoon characters we grew up adoring were finally seen side by side. Bugs Bunny, Mickey Mouse, Donald Duck, Daffy Duck, Droopy, Woody Woodpecker plus a slew of new memorable faces like Baby Herman, Jessica Rabbit, the Weasels, and of course, good old Roger. And I'm happy to announce we have a special guest on this episode, Roger Rabbit himself! Say hello, Roger! Roger? Huh? What? What? Oh. I'll have your rent money in a year or two. Roger, we have a video to do, and the contract you signed specifically said sober. Oh, so you've worked with entertainers before. Roger, are you okay? Better than ever. Go ahead, unzip your pants and we can get this over with. Dude, it's not that kind of video. <sighs> what happened to you, man? You're a big star. Yeah, I was going to be. Everybody loved me when the movie came out. What, people don't now? No, people don't even know I exist. Some film historian will bring me up here and there. But then I'm forgotten like always. Actually, yeah, not a lot was done with you afterwards, huh? At the time, the film was built up as the next evolution of cinema, with Spielberg producing, technical wizardry pushed to the limit, and one of the hottest directors at the time, Robert Zemeckis, at the helm. And that's one of the reasons so many copyrights were bent to bring characters together you would never see together. But aside from an occasional crossover, this mix of real life and hand-drawn animation never went that far. Even you just got a couple animated shorts and then practically vanished. Hey, I had a theme park that parents took their kids to whenever they wanted to sip on vodka from the sun lotion bottles. So, what have you been doing for money? What or who? Oh god. The stuttering pee thing can make a lot of people happy, if you know what I mean. Roger, I had no idea. It's not all bad. I do birthday parties sometimes. Well, that's nice. There's still some children interested in you. They're over 40. Yikes. The stuttering pee trick comes in handy there, too. <sighs> well, look, Roger, I know you're not as big a star as Mickey Mouse or Bugs Bunny or Betty Boop. You think Boop is bigger than me? Well, that's not what I... yeah. Christ. But your movie's more than just a technical landmark. It's a storytelling landmark. Lots of folks assume because there's kids' cartoons in it, it must be meant for children. But not only was this made at a time when PG really had a lot more of an edge to it. What the hell is wrong with that take? <laughs> Son of a bitch. But the way the film is written and directed displays great talent in how to quickly and subtly get across a lot of emotion and information. And because drunk people love saying how terrible they are so they can be told how great they are. That's not true. I'm worse than Bin Laden. I'm gonna point out why this film deserves to be analyzed over three decades later. So sit back and enjoy another look at Who Framed Roger Rabbit. No. Then get drunk and stay out of my way. Oh, so you know my family's crest. The film opens with a baby Herman and Roger Rabbit short. Roger is voiced by Charles Fleischer, who yes, did dress like a rabbit on set to get into character. And when he voiced Benny the Cab, he appropriately became a car. Why, I'll take care of him like he was my own brother! Though Roger is certainly designed and talks like a cartoon from the 40s, the short itself is much more modern with fast editing, extreme angles, and more fluidity. I kind of like that because it sets up what kind of a reality you're in for. One that dives deep into little details, but leaves the bigger questions vague. How do these tunes exist? Are they drawn to life? Do they evolve with humans? These details aren't as important as making it clear that animated shorts are apparently filmed in one shot with the title cards, fake legs, and even live music being halted when Roger messes up his line. Can we lose the playback, please? I'm 
Roger, you're killing me, killing me. That line, by the way, is Roger seeing birds instead of stars. How does a tune control that? Again, this detail's not as important as knowing that for tunes, this is a line, not a prop. This Roger, he keeps blowing his lines. Rabbit sees stars, not birds, stars. It's a lot like Edward Scissorhands. You don't ask how someone created a man or where those giant blocks of ice came from. Those details just aren't as important as the details that push the emotions and story forward. Like, take this incredible one shot that seamlessly goes from animation to live action, shows you how cartoons are made in this world, that Roger apparently has force powers, and introduces you to Eddie, played by Bob Hoskins. The staging in this one shot alone must have been insane, but that's not even what I want to focus on. I want to focus on this few seconds of Eddie's introduction. Tunes. The way he said that one word shows he hates tunes. Taking a swig of whiskey shows he's an alcoholic. Putting it in his gun holster shows he values his drink over protecting himself, and probably his work. And him being there at all shows he's desperate because someone wants him for a low-level job, and he obviously wouldn't be there by choice. It's crazy how much information they get across to you in just that one shot, and most of it's non-verbal. This really is master filmmaking, even when not focusing on the brilliant animation directed by the late great Richard Williams. We'll get to his contribution in a little bit. Mr. Maroon, Mr. Valiant's here too. Eddie is brought to cartoon producer R.K. Maroon, by the way, voice of the gorilla later, who says to help Roger with his lines, he wants Eddie to take some sexy pictures of his wife Jessica to calm him down. Give me a couple of nice, juicy pictures I can wise the rabbit up with. Admittedly, for a detective, he should have smelled he was being set up, but as everybody mocks him for, he's not exactly in his prime. From the smell of him, I'd say it was the booze talking. He looks like a sensitive and sober fellow. <laughs> Did you change your name to Jack Daniels? And pretty much everything in the next few minutes sets this up. He's trying to use the check on the trolley. He doesn't own a car. He fixes his broken sign. He throws out his bills. He knows all the bar flies and even borrowed money from his girlfriend. Fifty bucks? Where's the rest? My other man prostitutes pay me back a lot faster. Every little detail is setting up this character through a visual medium. Hey, mister, ain't you got a car? Who needs a car in LA? We got the best public transportation system in the world. May a nearby forest fire start if I'm wrong. See you later. Oh, mister. Thanks for the cigarettes. You Give me five 80s, PG. Mm -mm. Later that night, he goes to the Ink and Paint Club where tunes are allowed to perform, but not attend. This is a satire of the Cotton Club, where black people were allowed to be on stage, but not in the seats. In fact, the original book used tunes as an allegory for racism. Which, if this was made by Disney today, you know it'd be hammered in like sin, but... This film decides to be a little more subtle. There are a lot of little clues that add up, as the humans rarely consider the inequality between the two of them. They just see him as goofy entertainment to take advantage of. No, there's no justice for tombs anymore. Strictly humans only, okay? A laugh can be a very powerful thing. Why, sometimes in life, it's the only weapon we have. Again, a lot of emotional information that's gotten across in a natural way that doesn't feel manipulative. And yeah, when I was a kid, this was my Godzilla vs. Kong. <laughs> Does anybody understand what this duck is saying? Seeing these two together blew my mind. It was amazing not only to see them interacting off each other, but the original voice actors performing them as well. Sort of. Mel Blanc was still alive to voice Daffy, and Donald is a mix of replacement Tony Anselmo, and archived audio of the original actor Clarence Nash. It's also cool that Eddie is still friends with some tunes, like Betty Boop, still voiced by the original actress Mae Quistel. Work's been kinda slow since cartoons went to color, but I still got it, Eddie! Yeah, you still got it. So, can I get a menu, or...? After meeting the owner of Toontown, Marvin Acme, played by Jay Sherman. Oh, I mean Stubby K, sorry, I always confuse those two. This is Stubby K! We're introduced to Roger's wife, Jessica. The first... furry? I want you to know I love you. I've loved you more than any woman's ever loved a rabbit. But I get the feeling not as much as any man has ever loved a rabbit. Voiced by Kathleen Turner and accompanied by, I think, the crows from Dumbo. I gotta deal with being a minority and the minority of the minority and nobody support my ass. Let's just call it, Jessica's intro was many kids' sexual awakening. I know so many boys who went from... Nah, nah, girls are stupid. Well, well, you know, they're, uh, uh... Ah. She's married to Roger Rabbit. What a lucky girl. I hear his dick is huge. 
Unlike some other bombshell tunes, though, she is a legit interesting character. Despite her proportions being pretty hilarious, she looks like an hourglass if the Sahara Desert filled it up. She is written very mysteriously. While the villain of the film is rather clear, you're not always sure whose side she's on. Does she love Roger, or is she using him? As a cartoon human, is she more on the tune side or people side? Through most of the film, either is believable. Plus, everyone's reaction here is priceless. And... When Nettie is found peeping in her dressing room, the gorilla bodyguard tosses him out. Booga booga! Burn. While roaming down Gotham City, he peeks into her dressing room and finds her and Marvin Acme playing patty cake. Which, of course, is literally playing patty cake. But to a tune that's home base and purchasing the 1927 Yankees. I don't believe it! It can't be! It just can't be! That's against my wife! I love the faster he looks at it, it actually starts to animate like a real cartoon. But probably the biggest shock about this is, despite not seeing Roger and Jessica together often, you do weirdly buy them as a couple. They're polar opposites, but the way they talk about each other still shows they care for one another. No, 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 I love my husband. You've got me all wrong. I get the light of my light, the apple of my eye, the green of my coffee. Think Mel Brooks and Anne Bancroft if Brooks was less animated. This is followed by not only a great moment, but one of my favorite moments in film history. We see Eddie hanging up his hat on a Maltese falcon, nice touch, and looking over old pictures of his brother, as we're given a 100% visual history of their life together. It's hard to cite every detail in this one shot. The Betty Boop doll indicates maybe he was nicer to her because his brother liked her. The picture of their dad and them in the circus shows how fun-loving he used to be while also foreshadowing his tumbling act. The headline shows he used to work with Toons a lot, though how did Goofy get accused of this when Donald has the more damning footage? And Hoskins' look here along with the stellar music is enough to make anyone teary-eyed. And on top of that, in the same shot, they had to change the background to mourning, empty his bottle of alcohol, take off his jacket, adjust the lighting, and all without their shadows ever getting in the way or running into the camera operator. It hits you what an emotional and technical achievement this one shot really was. Christ, this movie is so good! He's awoken by Lieutenant Santino, played by Richard Leparmentier, who informs him that Roger apparently killed Marvin Acme last night. Just like a tune to drop a safe in a guy's head. Sorry, Eddie. What do you say we go to a piano bar later? Ooh. Right. Boy, Acme's blood must have been .0 invisible, because there's not a drop of it anywhere. <laughs> Ow! We're then introduced to Judge Doom, played by Christopher Lloyd, who, brace yourself, is the bad guy. Yeah, I think this is more like Columbo, where they make it clear who the villain is and the mystery is around why and how they'll be discovered. Hell, the dude literally has wind blowing in his cape in every shot. No matter, the rabbit won't get far, my men will find him. I dig too that he really looks like a toon disguised as an intimidating human. He reminds me of the bug from Men in Black, like every second he wants to break out of this false body. With artificial looking skin, exaggerated features, and teeth so white it makes Simon Cowell look less like the mask. Did you find the rabbit? Don't worry, Judge. He says he and his hired weasels are looking for Roger, in between random shoe killing. <laughs> With the only liquid known to kill tunes called the dip, he melts Nancy Cartwright shoe. No, really, that's Nancy Cartwright. Random! And while a lot of people were horrified by this scene, I have to admit, I found it kind of funny. <laughs> It's so over-the-top dark, I swear it served as a roadmap for Zemeckis' Christmas Carol. <laughs> I love how this shoe does absolutely nothing and he just kills it. I love how the red paint looks like blood. I love how Santino has to turn away because it's so horrific. When a guy who gets choked by Vader can't bear to look at something, you know harsh shit is going down. <laughs> And it also shows that despite Eddie's prejudice against tunes, even he can't take any joy out of this. Though it'd be kind of funny if he did. But this is how we handle things down in Toontown. I'd think you of all people would appreciate that. Hey, you know, while you're at it, could you maybe throw these guys in there too? My name is Jordan, and I'm in a dash! Look, I make a lot of these. This is the best I could do this week. Did you forget that one thing at the store? Now you can get snacks, drinks, and household essentials in 30 minutes with DoorDash. 
DoorDash connects you with the restaurants you love, right now, and right to your door. And now you can get the grocery essentials you need with DoorDash too. Get drinks, snacks, and other household items delivered in under an hour. Ordering is easy. Open the DoorDash app, choose what you want from where you want, and your items will be left safely outside your door with the contactless delivery drop-off setting. With over 300,000 partners in the U.S., Puerto Rico, Canada, and Australia, you can support your neighborhood go-tos or choose from your favorite national restaurants like Popeye's, Chipotle, and the Cheesecake Factory. And Dory Dory Dash Dash! That's my catchphrase, I think. I'm going to the offer for a limited time. Our listeners can get 25% off and zero delivery fees on their first order of $15 or more when you download the DoorDash app and enter the code NOSTALGIA2021. That's 25% off up to a $10 value and zero delivery fees on your first order when you download the DoorDash app in the App Store and enter the code NOSTALGIA2021. Can I hear that offer again? Of course, that's NOSTALGIA2021 for 25% off your first order with DoorDash. Subject to change, terms apply. So get what you need today. Why? Somebody's knocking at my door. Who could it be? Why is he undies? This one I have no excuse for. Summer is coming in hot, literally. But with me undies breathable and soft as heck fabrics, you can soak up the sun and feel cool for the summer. With a mix of classic colors and adventurous prints perfect for summer, express yourself in your own unique way. Because me undies believes that comfort is about more than what's touching your skin. It's about feeling comfortable in your own skin. No, seriously, this stuff's pretty cool. Like the fabric's really soft, the prints are really crazy and imaginative, and yeah, like the door said, it's summer, it's getting really hot. This stuff's really good. Go check it out. It's uh, back to the door. Designed to be the softest thing you've ever worn, the undies are energized by creativity and made for self-expression. Available in sizes from extra small to four extra large, the undies has countless styles and prints to choose from, so your buns can have more fun. That one was in the read? I did not make that one up. And the undies has a great offer for my viewers. For any first-time purchasers, you get 15% off and free shipping. The undies also has the protection-free philosophy. If you're not satisfied with any product for any reason, they'll refund or exchange it. No caveats, no questions. To get your 15% off your first order and free shipping, go to meundies.com slash nostalgia. That's meundies.com slash nostalgia. This has been the MeUndies door. Companies can have a door for a mascot, why not? Saying, don't just look comfortable, be comfortable. Don't forget to check me out playing Kingdom Hearts Fridays from 6 to 9 on Twitch. We got content six days a week. Hope to see you there. Back at Eddie's office, Baby Herman shows up to tell him Acme had a will leaving Toontown to the tunes, and that's the reason he was killed off. Why don't you run downstairs and get me a racing form? Oh! Even babies didn't treat women like people back then. Eh, who says they do now, actually? Upon further inspection, he finds Herman was right, and upon even more inspection, he finds Roger hiding out at his place. When a toon's in trouble, there's only one place to go. Valiant and Valiant. Not anymore. I suppose this is as good a time as any to talk about the phenomenal animation and the amazing support it had. On the one hand, you have the animation itself, which keep in mind there was no CGI back then to measure the lighting or geometric placement of where they should be, yet when they showed the first test to producers, some of them legitimately asked, who's the guy in the rabbit suit? And you're not gonna get away from me again, this time. Part of that is because another version of the film was shot with stand-ins to get an idea of where they would be and how the lighting would hit them. Compare this to, say, Tom and Jerry, where they move funny, but never fully look like they're there. Here, even in scenes where Zemeckis wanted to show off by having lighting constantly change, you completely believe they're sharing the same space, even getting the shadows and reflections down. Second is the support behind the animation. On top of the actor's brilliant conviction making you believe they're looking at something that's not there. Just watch actors with Jar Jar to figure out how tricky this can be. There was tons of miming, strings, and inventive mechanics to manipulate the world around them. Eddie's cuffs in this scene, for example, are just a sculpture frozen in this protruding position, as these two would constantly be struggling away from each other, so it would naturally be in that position. You don't think of these details as a kid, and sometimes you don't even think of them as an adult, which is a clear sign of how amazing a job the film is doing. Step out of line and we'll hang you and your laundry out to dry. After they escape the weasels, Eddie takes Roger to the bar. But tell me, Eddie, is that a rabbit in your pocket or are you just happy to see me? Can it be both? They get out of the cuffs and Eddie asks Dolores to check on Acme's probate. Yeah, check the probate. Why, my Uncle Thumper had a problem with his probate. Wait, 
It's not the same thumper I'm thinking of, is it? No, no. Totally unrelated. You embarrassed me, boy! Bite my fluffy tail, you Peter Rabbit reject! You would be nothing well, without me! Here? Do you know the Come things on down. I had to do? Come on down. I'm gonna just you pretend this isn't happening. Down, get the Nicholas I am Cage to my you. Francis Bring your fluffy more, ass here. Jessica visits Eddie to ask him to find Roger. And if you're wondering why he's getting out of the shower here, it's because there's a very long deleted scene where he's taken to Toontown as torture, putting a giant pig head on him that washes off in the shower. This was cut because it's fucking bizarre! There's no reason to have it in the film. It gives away part of the reveal of Toontown. And even Hoskins' accent and Lloyd's acting seem a little off. Rummaging around in a lady's dressing room. Tisk, tisk, tisk. If I'd have wanted underwear, I'd have broken into Fredericks of Hollywood. Now if you excuse me, I gotta go back to the British part of California. This is where Jessica says, in my opinion, one of the odder lines to become famous. It's not bad, it's just weird that this is the one everyone remembers. I'm not bad, I'm just drawn that way. How Frank Miller's later characters would talk. Dolores catches Eddie seemingly hitting on Jessica, and thank Jesus this misunderstanding only lasts a few seconds. I think the film itself even forgot it put it in there. I get the feeling this moment exists only for this one scene. Sorry. 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 Oh, sorry, it glitches there because it's been rewound so much, no reason. Roger can't help but entertain, and he outs himself at the bar, getting the attention of Doom. That guy Angelo would rat on you for a nickel! Mad Angelo, he'd never turn me in! I enjoy how Roger discusses the importance of winning people over through laughter, and yes, while standing on a soapbox. But it shows Eddie it can win someone even like Angela over, who won't turn him in because of it. Again, foreshadowing the importance of utilizing humor. Plus Doom using this vet's missing arm to erase the board. What a dick. A rabbit is going to come right to me. Doom has a plan to draw him out, though. No two can resist the old shave and a haircut trick. That's why neither the weasels nor I will fall for it. Oh, uh, that is, by I, I mean you. <laughs> Roger falls for the trick, but Eddie remembers that he goes crazy whenever he takes a shot of bourbon. Bourbon. Fine time for a drink, Eddie. Maybe you'd like a bowl of pretzels to go with it. Just pour the drink, Dolores. And yes, a bowl of pretzels would be great. <laughs> the drink works as Eddie fights off the weasels. Can they locate Roger's pal Benny in Doom's van? Benny, look out for the game! No! This seems pretty awesome because it's not just a chase, it's a cartoon chase. Animated logic has to be utilized all the time, even to the point where Eddie becomes a cartoon every once in a while. Hey, share the road, will you leave? They make their escape and hide out in a nearby theater. Nobody takes a wallop like Goofy. What timing, what a genius. Too bad he's a communist. <laughs> Wait, was he cleared of those spy charges? Dropped the piano on us from 15 stories. Eddie revealed that his prejudice was because his brother was killed by a tune who was never identified. And I don't know why, but this inappropriate joke in this serious scene really makes me laugh hard. Only he got the drop on us. Literally. <laughs> drop on us! And you said your sense of humor was gone! Because your brother is dead! And he figures out that RK Maroon has a part to play in this crime, and he meets up with him saying he has the will. Which he actually does with Roger's letter to Jessica, but nobody knows that yet. But Maroon is, well, a Maroon and gets jumped by him. I'm gonna listen to you spin the Cloverleaf scenario. The story of greed, sex, and murder. Well, greed, patty cake, and murder. Unless that's an art deleted scene. Maroon is shot, and the killer drives into Toontown. Eddie confronts his prejudice, pulls out a Toon gun, and even pours out the rest of his alcohol. See, folks, it's easy. You don't need 12 steps. Just stop being racist. I'm not sure what they were trying to say here. Smile. He enters Toontown filled with Disney archive footage that maybe they should have looked a little closer at. Hey, it's a 40s film about racism, kinda works. And he thinks he tracks down Jessica, but it's... not. He escapes to one of my favorite jokes in the movie. And he comes across a moment you will never see ever again. Me. What's up, Doc? In fact, one of the qualifications to get Bugs Bunny and Daffy Duck in the same scene as Mickey Mouse and Donald Duck is that they had to share the exact same amount of screen time. That's why you rarely see them alone, and they're often side by side. Even after Donald gets his alone time on screen, Daffy needs the exact same amount of alone time as well. But, being a Disney movie, Mickey is shown just a few seconds earlier. 
improving again. The mouse always needs to be number one. No Brooklyn accented puffy cheeked unionist is gonna upstage my goddamn wholesomeness! Wait, is someone recording this? Oh, you. Oh, I'll get him. Should probably ignore I have that. I will give credit that they made Mickey dark enough that he smiles at Bugs' almost fatal prank. Aw, poor fella. <laughs> yeah, ain't I a stinker? Ha <laughs> ha, we just killed a man. Save, but he outwits the imposter and continues his search for Jessica, who he thinks shot Maroon. Yeah, where's your editing on that, Disney Plus? I always knew I'd get it in Toon Town. Or that. Is that a rabbit in your pocket? You're just happy to see me. Behind you! Jessica reveals it was Doom who killed RK Maroon as they try to outrun the weasels and search for Roger. I have to find my darling husband. I'm so worried about him. Seriously? What do you see in that guy? He's got a big dick. There's a reason he wears pants that baggy. Doom stops them by- Wait, wait, I got one more. You know how when you pull out a mallet, it's really tiny in your pocket, but then when it's out, it's like gigantic? Doom stops them by pouring dip on Benny's tires, and don't pause this scene on VHS. It'll grow up your kids too early. Not my Jessica! Do they have a will or not? Nah, just a stupid love lady. Doom reveals that without the will, he'll be the owner of Toontown and plans to obliterate it to put up a freeway. Most likely a commentary on gentrification and not caring for the people who live there. Again, tying back into the racism allegory. No one's going to notice Toontown's disappeared! Who's got time to wonder what happened to something nice when you're driving by at 75 miles an hour? How else could you explain words like this suddenly sounding evil? Inexpensive motels, restaurants that serve rapidly prepared food, and wonderful billboards! My god, it sounds a lot like Disney. Roger tries to save the day, but he gets captured as well. Eddie, however, gives in to his silly side and makes the weasels literally laugh themselves to death. But then Doom enters the picture and... He defeats him. Yeah, pretty easy, actually. Nothing too difficult. Well, that's not what happens. Yes, it is. Why don't you want to talk about... No, that's really it. Nothing else. No, no, Mr. Critic, there's so much more. You know what scene you're leaving out. No, 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 there's really no scene. Oh, dear. Perhaps did you repress this? Remember me, critic! When I killed your childhood, I talked! Alright. Let's talk about this scene. After a suspenseful fight with some damn good effects of Doom getting flattened and getting back up, he's revealed to be a toon. And did I say the shoe scene scar childhoods? This one Adam bombed it. Many kids and even adults were terrified at honestly a simple effect, but so effectively done. Though I always wondered what kind of Inspector Gadget tune he was supposed to be. Nothing compared to the nightmare impact he left behind. The only thing scarier, Lloyd's face without the animation. Jesus. This will forever go down in history as one of the most terrifying things ever put in any kid-ish media. There. Was that so bad? I don't know. You want to clean up my seat? I'm good. I could use the money. Eddie sprays Ecto Cooler all over the place and Doom's finally defeated. Still easier than the Nintendo game. <laughs> the police and the Toons arrive to discover not only was Doom responsible for Acme's murder, but the will was Roger's letter to Jessica with disappearing, reappearing ink. <laughs> doesn't seem too happy. Maybe he was like, eh, I invested in Cloverleaf. That was a pretty funny dance he did for the weasels. And he also seems to have gotten his sense of humor back until Roger zaps him with a hand buzzer. Don't tell me you lost your sense of humor already. Does this answer your question? No, he's still a good sport. The tunes sing absolutely nobody's favorite song, and that freeway idea will never fuck up California in any way possible. Gotta love, too, how they couldn't let a Warner Brothers character have the final scene. <laughs> yeah, he gets the last line, but it's Tinkerbell who gets the last frame of film. Even though Peter Pan wasn't released until six years later. But time has no place in Neverland. It's a low blow. The credits roll, and everyone's thankful for great talents like Robert Zemeckis, Steven Spielberg, and Kathleen Kennedy? Huh. 
Actually, she produced a lot of amazing things. But people don't like her now because of Star Wars. There must be something she produced that was bad to make this joke work. Okay, that feels better. Who Framed Roger Rabbit may not have jump-started a new evolution in film, but honestly, that might be one of the reasons it's so one-of-a-kind. On a technical level, it's truly unique, as no mix of live action and 2D animation has ever looked this good or had this many crossovers. On a storytelling level, it's also amazing how to get across so much character and information in such a tight amount of time without having to over-explain anything. It's also impressive that a character like Roger doesn't become annoying. He's still authentic of that time period, but is perfectly funny and agitating in the way the film needs. All the acting is stellar, it's wildly imaginative, it looks amazing, even the music is absolute first-rate. Even though this movie won't start any cinematic universes, it still works on a variety of levels. So, if you haven't seen it in a while, take another watch and rediscover the best of your childhood with just the right amount of an adult edge. Well, those are some very kind things to say. Well, I really think you and this movie have made a much bigger impact than you probably give credit for. Honey bunny, let's play. All right, be right there. Oh, right, you're married to Jessica. Yeah, but I still got a rough life. No, you don't. You're right. Honey bunny. On my way, figure eight, buddy. Ah. Why the hell did I feel sorry for him? Booga booga! Hey, Doug Walker here doing the charity shout out. You're gonna be so angry because it is a cat related charity, and Buster and Chaplin are sleeping right now, and I didn't wanna wake them up. So, uh, regardless, uh, if you love Buster and Chaplin and uh, you love cats in general, this is a really good one to check out. It is called uh, Alley Cat Allies. Uh, founded in 1990, Alley Cat Allies is dedicated to the protection and humane treatment of cats. Uh, their mission is to end the killing of cats and lead the movement for their humane care. They advocate for pounds and shelters to keep public records of animal intake, uh, intake and kill rates for public and mandatory government oversight and for increased pound and shelter accountability. They support the efforts of and act as the national voice for thousands of individuals and groups across the United States who provide humane care for stray and feral cats. Uh, with a four star rating on Charity Navigator, come on guys. It's cats. Cats are adorable. They're wonderful. And this is a really good organization. As you can hear, they got four stars on uh, Charity Navigator. And I I'm sure Buster and Chaplin are dreaming about how awesome this charity is. So sorry I couldn't get them at the end of this one. But uh, watch the last Tom and Jerry episode. They're, they're in that one, uh, the Tom and Jerry movie. So uh, that's about it. And I'll see you next time. Take care.